Hello. Uh, today we will talk about vaccines for arboviral diseases. Well, uh, in the last 50 years, uh, we have seen uh, emer the emergence of uh, epidemics arbovirals, mainly dengue, chikungunya, zika, and yellow fever. Uh, in Brazil, we have all these four uh, endemic arbovirals, yellow fever as a sylvatic cycle uh, with sabetes and hemagogos as the main vectors. And uh, um, also we have dengue, chikungunya, and Zika in, with ur urban transmission and Aedes aegypti as the vector. Uh, we have also here the, the vectors, and we have also to, to point out that the Amazon region are a nursery for arbovirals, and we have lots of them, and some of them, such as the uh, Mayaru or uh, Oroposh, sometimes causes human diseases and even outbreaks. Uh, all, uh, among these uh, major arbovirals, we have vaccines for yellow fever and dengue that are licensed, and for Zika and chikungunya in development, and uh, for Zika in phase, uh, phase in clinical trials, phase one or two. But today we'll talk only about the vaccines for yellow fever and dengue. Well, the vaccine for yellow fever is a live attenuated virus that is in use since 1937 with more than 600 million doses administered. So it is well known. It's produced in chicken and eggs. And in Brazil, we have two producers, Bill Manguinhos, that is the main producer and uh, it's one who is in use in public health at SUS. And uh, we have also some fifth Pasteur vaccine, mainly in private sector, but sometimes also in the public sector. Uh, we, uh, the, the vaccine is recommended all over the country and uh, uh, the administration starts at nine months of age. Uh, protecting and neutralizing antibodies is demonstrated in most vaccinees 30, 30 days after vaccination, but children less than two years old have a lower seroconversion. Uh, as a Yellow, as a live attenuated vaccine, there are some contraindications, mainly under five, under six months of age children, immunocompromised persons, and uh, persons with Timus disease. And we have also some precautions, uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding, persons aged more than six years, and those with this hypersensitivity to egg or a vaccine component, but these are not a formal contraindication to vaccination. Uh, mainly in outro breaks, we can use this vaccine in those persons. The vaccine has some adverse events. The most common, uh, a flu-like disease with headache and fever, low fever, that starts seven to 10 days after vaccination. And uh, it occurs in up to 20% of the vaccinees. But we also have rare, ad severe adverse events, most common hypersensitivity reactions, but also neurologic disease and viscerotropic disease. The neurologic disease can be acute meningitis or encephalitis caused 
by direct viral injury, but we also have demyelinating uh, inflammatory disease, autoimmune disease, mainly Guillain-Barré syndrome and ADEN. The viscerotopic disease is the main concern regarding this vaccine. It's the most rare of all these severe uh, events, but uh, uh, it has a high, a high case fatality rate. And uh, it is a, a yellow fever similar disease. The major risk for these severe adverse events are the first doses and extremes of aging. Uh, this, this is a report from Brazil from this period, from 1999 to 2009, when we had in the country more than uh, 500 cases of yellow fever caused by the wide virus with a case fatality of 43%. And we have administered more than 100 million doses of the vaccine. We had 727 severe adverse events. Hypersensitivity reactions, there were 600 cases with a rate of 0 0.6 per 100 million doses administered. Uh, neurologic disease, we had 99 cases with uh, a rate of 0 0.1 by 100 million doses. And viscerotropic diseases, we have 28 cases, a rate of uh, 0 0.03 per 100 million doses, but with a case fatality of 75%. Most of the cases were in the first, after the first two doses. Uh, we recently had in Brazil uh, a major outbreak starting in the end of 2016, and that lasted until 2018, when we had more than 2,000 cases in just two years, with seven. Uh, 144 deaths as compared to 873 uh, 73 cases in 35 years before this, uh, this, these years. Uh, yellow fever in Brazil is historically endemic in the Amazon region and in the Midwest. But since the, the beginning of 2000s, this disease has expanded to the east and to the south. In 2008, we had a great outbreak in uh, Rio Grande do Sul, a, a state that had never had yellow fever before. Well, in 2016, we start to have some cases in north of Minas Gerais, a previous free transmission area. And uh, in 2016-17 season, these cases expanded to uh, all over Minas Gerais, Espírito Santo, Rio de Janeiro, and São Paulo, an area that's highly populated and uh, uh, the epidemics were approached to major metropolitan areas, São Paulo and Rio. Um, uh, this is a, a picture of Monte Alegre in São Paulo, where we had a, a major outbreak. And as you can see, the disease uh, was transmitted in this green area uh, around the city. Uh, the Silvatic Sitter cycle was responsible for uh, transmission. And uh, this is a picture of the Sao Paulo City, the north area of Sao Paulo City, the biggest city in the country. And uh, as you can see, the, the 
division of the urban area and the forest is quite abrupt. And the disease is occurring here, but people go to the forest. And this is Horto Florestal in Sao Paulo, a big park inside the city that had transmission of yellow fever at that time. So it was always in the forest, but the forest is inside the city. Well, to overcome this outbreak, we have two major strategies. The first one was a, a strategy developed by a researcher uh, from Sao Paulo uh, that observed that the deaths of monkeys, the, the local and the date of that monkeys can predict where the virus is going to. So in this map, you can see the, the uh, red lines are those uh, uh, roaches that the virus has already made. And the orange one are the probable ones that the virus will take based in uh, where it comes from and the green areas of this area. This is the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo city. And as you can see, the, the big area was not involved, only the green areas in uh, around the city. This strategy allowed it to prioritize vaccination uh, and vaccinated the, the population before the virus has, has, uh, has arrived, before uh, the, the monkey's deaths are observed. So in this map, the yellow areas are areas uh, prioritized for vaccination and the red ones are areas that were secondary priority. Uh, this is, was a very successful strategy. It's, yeah, it was very uh, new and different from what was recommended before. And as you can see here, this is uh, the posterior in time uh, when the, the disease went to the south of the country in 2019. And the, the same thing, the red lines are the ones that the virus has had a red taking and the orange ones, the probable one. And as you can see here, we also have the posterior cases in, um, in monkeys, uh, monkeys the edges here in green and here in red, the human cases. So uh, you can see that this can really predict you where you are going to have cases. Well, the second strategy was fractional dose of yellow fever vaccination, meaning we vaccinate people with a half or one fifth of the standard doses. The usual dose of yellow fever vaccine produced by Bill Manguinhos uh, contains more than uh, 25,000 uh, platform unities of the attenuated virus, whereas it has been demonstrated in previous studies by Bill Manguinhos that only 3,000 are enough for protection. The SAGE, the WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts, reviewed the evidence and recommended that fractional dose could be used in mass vaccination campaigns in response to outbreaks when vaccine supply is insufficient, what was the case of Brazil in 2018. This strategy had already been uh, used in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, in 2016, when uh, almost 8 million persons were vaccinated one, with one-fifth of the uh, Guillemanguinhos vaccine, and uh, no cases were detected after vaccination. 
Well, this is the uh, Phil Cruz study on fractional doses. They tried five doses in comparison to the standard dose. And as you can see here, and also in this graphic, all doses that was uh, more uh, 587 or more produced the high seroconversion similar to the standard doses. Only these two lower doses produce the lower seroconversion. The same was seen with the, the antibody titers with all these lower doses producing the same. So uh, based on antibody response, those of five, uh, 600 or more would be protective. In this study, they also study uh, cytokines and they show it that doses of 3000 or more uh, produced similar cytokines uh, that the standard doses. So it was defined that at least the 3000 should be used. Well, there are also studies with the Sanofi Pasteur vaccine showing uh, 150 of doses is enough. And now we have studies at, uh, of the longer follow-up with it, eight to 10 years showing uh, that seropositivity maintains over 85% or more. Uh, this is also uh, the studies of um, Democratic Republic of Congo, a cohort study after mass vaccination, showing that most people sort of convert with the fractional doses used in routine immunization. So this is really experienced. And uh, we use the fractional dose in areas uh, with new uh, spread of the yellow fever, where the virus, virus were not present before in Sao Paulo State, Rio de Janeiro, and Bahia. The goal was to vaccinate over 20 million persons in three months. But at the end of this time, the vaccine coverage in this population was 50% in Rio and 54 in Sao Paulo. And there were some areas with lower coverage. The problem was fake news that was disseminated uh, regarding the yellow fever vaccine, fractional dose uh, being not protective. And this was really important at that time at and uh, people avoid the fractional dose. But it's an, an important strategy for uh, outbreaks, especially when we are running short of the, the vaccine. Well, another problem with the yellow fever vaccination is the schedule. Uh, since 2013, the WHO uh, recommends a single dose in life for everybody. Uh, this uh, recommendation was based in a review of uh, previous studies conducted since the 40s that showed that more than 9% vaccinees had uh, antibody titers in, uh, in up to 20 years after vaccination. And then after 20 years, 8% vaccinees had antibodies. But there, furthermore, the prevention of outbreaks with herbal transmission, uh, it's uh, gotten when 8% of population are immunized. immunized. And they also assumed that primary vaccine failure is rare. Uh, I studied from Binho Manguinhos 
in Rio and Minas, uh, when these states were not endemic, so it's an area free of transmission, uh, with uh, uh, more than 600 uh, participants, adults, that received just one shot of yellow fever. They showed that in the first five years after vaccination, seropositivity was demonstrated in more than 9% of persons. But after five years, seropositivity decreased to 83 uh, in those vaccinated in the last 10 years and 76% in those vaccinated 10 to 11 years before. Also, the antibody titers that are, were height at the first year decreased in the second year. Furthermore, we had another study in Brazil that analyzed the more than 800 cases that occurred in Brazil from 73 to 2008, and they found 3.2% of persons, 27, that were, were vaccinated 10 years, uh, within 10 years of the disease. So uh, the point is, is one dose and an off in a country with endemic transmission and uh, uh, considering we have uh, the sylvatic cycle, so uh, uh, herd protection does not apply, and uh, we have uh, outbreaks of the disease and from time to time, and people are individually exposed. So most of researchers in Brazil think two doses are necessary for everybody here, do, do, uh, considering the characteristics of the vaccine, the primary failure, the decrease, waning antibody, and also the sylvatic cycle. Um, we used to have two doses in our, our schedule, but we adopted a single dose in life in 17, uh, when the vaccine was short and there was an outbreak. In uh, last year, we uh, start to give a second dose for all those persons who have received the vaccine uh, in the first five years of life, uh, because there is demonstration that at that time, the vaccine is less, uh, led, uh, led to lower soil conversion. But uh, this is an open uh, and um, adults are now vaccinated with just a single dose, although uh, most persons considered it's not enough. Well, going to dengue. Well, dengue has been increasing all over the country, uh, all over the country and all, also in the world. In the last 50 years, mainly in America, Latin America and Asia, we have outbreaks for all five or four uh, types. And uh, in the last eight years, we have five, five, five years with more than a million cases. Last year, uh, 20, 2020, we had more than a million cases. It's not here, but we had more than a million cases. Even so, we had the surveillance teams uh, displaced to work with the uh, COVID-19. The dengue prevention now is based in vectorial control that has the advantage of controlling multiple diseases, dengue, zika, chikungunya, uh, urban yellow fever, but uh, it has 
high costs, it is difficult to sustain, and uh, it has been inefficient to interrupt the transmission. So dengue vaccine development is considered a high priority in public health. Challenges in dengue vaccine development, the most important is the antibody dependent enhancement disease. The first infection uh, by dengue confers long term homotypic, homotypic immunity and temporary protection against other serotypes. After this two or three years, a second infection by a different serotype may occur, and it is associated with greater disease severity. And uh, this occurs because not neutralizing antibodies with low affinity with the, uh, to heterotypic um, dengue serotypes facilitated the entrance of the virus in the cells and its replication. Furthermore, there is no established correlate of protection. The serological test does not predict protection by vaccine, as you will see later. There is an incomplete understanding of protective immunity, and there is no more animal model to study dengue uh, infection and disease. So it has been really difficult to, to develop a, the ideal dengue vaccine, which should be safe, must have balanced response for all four serotypes, which has been very difficult to obtain, should confer long lasting protection, should not, do not, uh, must not induce enhancement disease, uh, allowing vaccination of both seropositive and seronegative people, do not interfere with other vaccines, have few doses as possible, and have a good price. Here are are the, the dengue vaccines that are in clinical phase of development or the one that is licensed, that is the only one CDTDV from Sanofi. Uh, we have three live attenuated vaccines, the licensed one, but, and also these two. We have also an inactivated, uh, whole, whole virus vaccine, and we have uh, vaccines based in proteins or in DNA, but all these are based on uh, env protein or premembrane, premembrane and envelope. And we, at last, we have uh, uh, a strategy uh, with, with heterologous priming boosting, with live attenuated and inactivated whole cell vaccine in priming or boosting. We'll talk about these three vaccines that are sensitive or in phase three. Well, the first one is the Sanofi vaccine, Dengvaxia, uh, which is licensed. It is a virus, a virus attenuated by chimerization. What is that? It has a backbone of yellow fever vaccine virus with all known structural genes of yellow fever virus, and in which dengue genes of premembrane and envelope of each one of dengue serotypes was inserted. So we have four chimeras for dengue one, dengue two, dengue three, and dengue four. It, it requires three doses administered in 12 months. It has been shown it's safe and well tolerated 
and uh, neutralizing antibody response to all four serotypes is demonstrated with the higher antibodies to dengue 2 and lower titers to dengue 4. Here are the, is the results of phase 3 trials that showed that the vaccine efficacy was dependent of serotype with lower efficacy to dengue 2, both in Asia and in Latin America, and higher efficacy to dengue 4. Uh, you, in the slide before, I told you that the antibody titers were higher for dengue 2 and lower to dengue 4. So there is no correlation of antibody titers to clinical protection. The vaccine efficacy is also dependent of age with lower efficacy in children less than nine years of age and lower efficacy in those under five years. It all, uh, also depend on the dengue serum status at baseline with higher efficacy in seropositive persons and lower efficacy in seronegative. In a way that in children less than nine years, the vaccine has no efficacy. And at least it was demonstrated that in the third, third year, uh, there was a increase in hospitalization in children under five. In this slide, uh, in long-term studies up to uh, five years, more or less, you can see in children uh, aged two to 16, all cohort, uh, we can see that in seropositive persons here in head, the, uh, the dashed line is vaccinated and the full line is placebo. So we can see that hospitalization rate is, was higher in placebo seropositive children than in vaccine vaccinated children. But when we looked to the seronegative, we can see that the hospitalization rate was higher in the seronegative vaccinated than in those that received the, the placebo. When we look only to the older uh, children and adolescents, we can see the same pattern here with lower hospitalization in placebo than in vaccines. So it raises the concerns regarding enhancement disease caused uh, by vaccine and manifesting in a secondary uh, wide virus infection. Uh, the vaccine was licensed in 2015 for people aged more than nine years. And after these long-term studies had been available, WHO uh, recommended it. it must be used only to seropositive persons in high endemic areas, meaning those where seroprevalence at the age of vaccination is at least 7%. Preferently with pre vaccination screening. The ideal test for pre vaccination screening should have high specificity to have a, a low, degree, low degree of uh, false positive results, uh, decreasing the risk of inadvertent vaccination of persons not exposed to dengue. It must also have high sensitivity 
to increase individual and population benefits by uh, correctly identifying large proportion of persons who was previously exposed to dengue. Must not have cross-reaction with other arboviruses and preferably be a rapid test. So screening at vaccination site is possible with results available in short time, allowing testing and vaccination on the same day. It should be easy to perform and have low costs. Well, this ideal test does not exist. So it's not possible today to have a good test for uh, pre-vaccination screening. WHO is working with the test producer to develop this test, but right now it's not possible. Now, Brazil has a very heterogeneous distribution of dengue disease last year. As you can see, the incidence uh, in the first semester when we have most cases, uh, in this year was concentrated here in the Midwest and uh, North area of Southeast states. But sometimes it occurs mainly in the Northeast or in Rio de Janeiro. And so it, uh, it differs from year to year and is quite heterogeneous. So it is, very difficult to define the, uh, a region where the vaccine would be uh, applicable. Uh, the last seroprevalence uh, study that was conducted in Brazil in 2016 showed that no area uh, has seroprevalence at 90 years uh, over 70%. Most of areas has uh, seroprevalence less than 50%. So, has uh, um, shaped studies of new dengue vaccines, mainly uh, the requirement that uh, the studies of uh, phase two and three should have longer follow-up and no vaccine will be licensed with less than five years of follow-up to demonstrate safety, mainly of uh, uh, enhancement disease and also immune response and efficacy. Regarding the other two vaccines, uh, the first one is the NIH Putant vaccine, that is also a live attenuated vaccine. The NIH developed this vaccine that is uh, the, the three dengue virus was aware uh, attenuated by nucleotide deletion, and dengue 2 virus is a chimera of dengue 4 attenuated with premembrane and envelope genes of dengue 2. The NIH uh, vaccine was a liquid formulation, and Butantan had a lyophilized formulation. It has the advantage of single doses, and the phase two studies showed the balanced antibody response to all four serotypes that was sustained for one year. Uh, phase three trials are going on, and uh, the results uh, are expected for in short time. The other one is the Takeda vaccine, that is also a uh, attenuated virus vaccine. Here, it, they attenuated the dengue 2 virus and built 
chimeras of dengue one, dengue three, and dengue four having the backbone of dengue two uh, attenuated with pre-membrane and envy of dengue one, dengue three, and dengue four. Uh, this vaccine requires two doses in three months interval, so it's better than Sanofi vaccine, and we have uh, preliminary results of uh, phase three. In phase two, it shows, sorry. Well, here. In phase two, it showed that neutralizing antibody titers were higher to dengue two and lower to dengue three, more lower to, uh, for, I, I will restart this, this, this slide. So, uh, Akeda phase two trials results showed heightened neutralized antibody titers to dengue two and lower titer, titers to dengue one, then to three, and the lower titers to dengue four. It also showed that seropositive persons have high titers persisted for six months, while seronegative persons have lower titers that decrease with time, time and there, is, there was no response after the second dose. And then uh, and the phase three, three trials, the preliminary results uh, at 18 months follow up, showed that the, an overall efficacy of 8% greater than Sanofi, that was 65, and also an efficacy dependent of the serotype with greater efficacy to dengue two and lower efficacy to dengue four, uh, the contrary of the Sanofi Pasteur vaccine. It also showed that ser negative persons have lower efficacy and uh, the efficacy was also dependent of age with no efficacy demonstrated in seronegative children under five. So the pattern of response was very similar to the Sanofi Pasteur vaccine. So it raised the question, will this vaccine also induce enhancement disease? We will have a efficacy, uh, efficacious dengue vaccine. And um, this uh, paper published the last year discussed the immune, re immune response to dengue virus. Here uh, he pre uh, is presented the re immune response to disease, to infection by dengue, wide dengue. And uh, it showed that uh, the pre-membrane protein induces cross-reactive non-neutralizing uh, antibodies that induces enhancement disease. The envelope protein fusion loop at top also uh, elicits cross-reactive neutralizing antibodies that have transient protection against heterotypic dengue, but uh, in later, in longer follow-up, enhance replication of heterotypic dengue enhancement disease. These uh, pre-membrane antibodies are produced in 6% of persons uh, with dengue. And this one, this, in 20 to 30 percent. There are other two uh, types of uh, um, antibodies to uh, envelope dimer epitopo that uh, induces cross-neutralizing antibodies for 
all the serotypes with low enhancement potential. And uh, this one that is director, directed to the receptor binding domain in the envelope host cell. And this is a type specific, highly potent neutralizing antibody that seems to provide lifelong hemotypic protection with low risk of enhancement disease. So what the authors discuss, discuss is that uh, we have to choose uh, antigens that induce not, not uh, um, that induce antibodies that are neutralizing with low potential of enhancement disease. Most of holy, holy virus vaccines will induce mem premembrane and envelope fusion loop epitope. So these authors believe that uh, leave attenuated vaccine and whole virus vaccine inactivated will cause enhancement disease. And we would have a chance with uh, selective proteins and uh, with uh, a recombinant vaccine that would induce just antibodies to this domain. There is a, a candidate vaccine with this uh, antigen that is in preclinical trials. So the news are not so good, but we have some hope in the long term. Well, that is it. Thank you very much.